Thomas Alva Edison, the man you see before you now. He gave the world sight, he gave the world sound, and he gave the world light. Sight from his motion picture camera, sound from his phonograph, and light, light from his Edison bulb, from his, his electricity. The old man, the wizard of Menlo Park, holds 1,093 United States patents, the man who industrialized the world, the greatest American inventor ever. No, simply the greatest inventor ever. The man of the century. More. The man of the millennium. The man, the man you see before you now. Thomas Alva Edison. A man I have come to hate very, very much. During the initial years of electricity distribution, Edison's direct current was the standard for the United States, and Edison did not want to lose all his patent royalties. Edison made significant improvements to the idea of incandescent light and wound up in the public consciousness as the inventor of the light bulb and a prime mover in developing the necessary infrastructure for electric power. The patent of a light bulb itself is a journey filled with ups and downs. The first successful test on a bulb with a carbon filament was on October 22, 1879. It lasted 40 hours. He filed a U.S. patent on November 4, 1879 and was granted on January 27, 1880. The vulnerability of this patent was that it described several ways of creating the carbon filament, including cotton and linen thread, wool splints, papers coiled in various ways. Edison was working on one of the examinations his team made on the shore of Battle Lake in the present state of Wyoming. This was the examination of carbonized bamboo which could be used as filament and last up to 1,200 hours. The original purpose of the trip by him and other scientists was to clearly observe the total eclipse of the sun. In 1878, Edison formed the Edison Electric Light Company in New York City with several financiers, including J.P. Morgan and the members of the Vanderbilt family. Edison made the first public demonstration of his incandescent light bulb on December 31, 1879 in Menlo Park. It was during this time that he said, We will make electricity so cheap that only the rich will burn candles. Playwright Ben Clausen wrote a play on the subject, War of Currents. The Dangers of Electric Lighting was a commission from Luna Stage, which is a, a 20-something-year-old theater company in Jersey that moved to a brand new theater in West Orange. And uh, they got in touch with me about writing a play for them about Thomas Edison. West Orange is a most famous resident, their citizen of the millennium. It wasn't till I saw the, the little sidebar on the War of the Currents and his conflict with Tesla that, uh, that I thought I found something that could be the, the heart of a play. When a, a dramatist looks to create a story, you always start with conflict. You know, what's, uh, what's the problem? And the richer the problem, the better the story. And uh, I found in researching the War of the Currents just a really uh, rich, detailed, and, and complex conflict. And uh, a lot of people describe it or think of it as simply uh, Edison versus Tesla. You've got Edison on this side, Tesla on this side, and they went head to head. And uh, as as I looked into the conflict, I that's not the way I really saw it because uh, the War of the Currents ended up being. Uh, almost a media smear campaign of uh, launched mostly by Edison towards the Westinghouse company which was the the main company working with alternating current and if you look at everything involved in that smear campaign there was a lot of negative things said about Westinghouse there was a lot of negative things said about the alternating current a man I first laid eyes on in the summer of 1884. I'm not sleeping. Uh, uh, oh, very well, I am... Nor is that an invitation to speak. I, oh, yes. I am not asleep. 
but I am at work, and I wanted to clarify that because nothing is more awkward than one grown man trying to gently wake another grown man, which you needn't attempt, as I am not sleeping. Yes. I am, however, at work, and it's just as delicate to interrupt a working man, as I'm sure you'd agree. I most certain... As I thought you would. So, if you'd give me a moment... I would. Shh, well... I've lost it. Look what you've done now. Who are you? I have a letter. You're a man with a letter. I am Nikola Tesla, a man with a letter. You know Batch. Uh, pardon? You know Batch. Uh, uh yes, Mr. Bachelor, yes. Yes, so you don't know him. I know Mr. Bachelor, yes. If you knew him, you know you'd call him Batch. I know Mr. Bachelor. I do know him. I was under his employ at your company in Paris. As it says in the letter. It is a joke, Mr. Tesla. It when? Batch. All that. An American joke. You've just come from Paris? Yes. And before that? Croatia to Austria, Austria to Prague, Prague to France, France to New York City. And here we are. Here we are indeed. Indeed. Have you read this letter, Batch's letter? And Mr. Batch... Mr. Batch's letter, yes. Have you read it? I have, yes. You read it? Yes. And yet you give it to me anyway? It seems, yes. I know two great men. You are one of them. The other is this young man. That's quite a statement. I thought so. Do you agree with it? I... Do you not must. No. You handed me the letter. You know what is inside. Two great men, you, myself, are one of them. The other is this young man, yourself. To hand me the letter, you must agree with the sentiment. I would not think to deprive Mr. Bachelor of conveying his opinion. Ah, Batch, but Charlie Bachelor has always been prone to exaggerated talk and uh, flourished prose, hasn't he? I wouldn't know. Then you don't know Batch. I know Mr. Bachelor, yes. Huh, here we are. Two great men, one great man meets another great man. What a feats of greatness have you been up to lately, Mr. Tesla? I've been up to, uh, what is it I've been up to? I have, uh, oh yes, I had grown bored as I had finished making from scratch the world's first device for recording and playing sound and had just created history's only constantly running, ceaselessly producing invention factory and um, didn't really know what to do with myself so I bought a couple of buildings downtown on a fairly dirty little street called Pearl. Oh, uh, I forgot to mention, I invented the first perfect system for producing and spreading electricity. Breezed by that point right now. What time is it? It is. doesn't matter what time it is because right now always those dynamos are running, sending clean, bright light to 10,164 lamps throughout Manhattan. And slowly, slowly, city by city, Spot by spot, the dark globe is beginning to light up and the course of man has been forever changed. Is that what I've been up to lately? One of the two great men sitting in this room, what is it, uh, Mr. Tesla? What is it that you've been up to lately? Voyaging across the Atlantic. <laughs> Not bad. Mine is better. Yes. Hmm, yes. You were working when I came in? I was. I see you are not a man who has trouble balancing rest and productivity. A joke. But not an American joke, Mr. Tesla. You wish to work for me? I do. Throwing uh, his uh, preposterous rhetoric aside, Mr. Bachelor vouches for your skill. So go to this address. They'll put you to work. May I inquire as to the hours and the pay? The hours and the pay? Yes. Well, Mr. Tesla, we work all the time and never get paid. The hours are acceptable, but I have a small complaint as to the salary. On your way. Wait, how many great men did Charlie say he knew? Uh, Mr. Bachelor, in that one letter, he, uh, said he knew two. Who were they? One was, as could be expected, Thomas Edison. And the other? As could not be expected, it was Nikola Tesla. That's what I recalled as well. Give me that address. Here's an ocean liner, docked here in East River. VSS Oregon? Yes. Anything sound odd about that yet? No. It should. The ocean liner should not be docked. It should be on the ocean. But it's not, because on board are two of my dynamos, and neither is working. 
It's losing the money, which is losing us money, and worst, it's creating bad press. The Oregon is the fastest ocean liner in existence, and I want you to put it back to the ocean. I want you to repair my dynamos. Very well. Very well? Very well. I returned to Mr. Edison early the next morning. Ah, my other great man, my Parisian, you're late. Late? Couldn't find the boat? Couldn't... Uh, no, I found the boat. I had them sending up some attics for the dynamos, plus the logs for the original installation team. I would have preferred you been able to start last night. I'm afraid those will not be necessary. Suddenly not feeling up to the job. Suddenly finished the job. Come again? I fixed it. Fixed it? Which one? Which dynamo? Both. Fixed it. It being the Oregon. You repaired the electrical system in a single evening? Yes. This is a good man. I have many hard-working assistants, but Tesla takes the cake. The cake? Yes, the cake. You've taken it. The entire cake now belongs to you. And this is good? Of course it's good. It's cake. Uh -huh. The pie, however, I will take. You may have the cake to do with it what you wish. I will retain full rights and possession of the pie. It seems to me Edison uh, has been quoted as saying, I care less about making a fortune and more about getting ahead of the other fellow. And it's from, from my view of what I read, Edison was used to winning and he wanted to continue winning. Um, his motivations for why he was so passionate about the direct current being better than the alternating current uh, are still up for debate. It's uh, a debate that's in the play, and I don't think it's something there's ever going to be a real answer to. Uh, the question of if he believed it was dangerous, uh, it's something that he followed through so heartily with and never really deviated from. I think he truly did believe the alternating current was more dangerous, but he also wanted the direct current to be the one that electrified America because it was his system. And he wanted to win. He wanted to, to get ahead of the other fellow. Let us hear on the subject from executives working at Cotton Edison Company in New York City. Edison, of course, uh, had his first generating plant at Pearl Street, Lower Manhattan, just on the edge of the Wall Street section. Right now, it's basically a plaque. But when that opened up in uh, the 1880s, it was revolutionary. Uh, Edison uh, was delivering electricity to basically rich people. Uh, because nobody else could afford electricity. Everybody else was lighting their home by uh, candlelight. There were gas lights, but only the rich had gas lights in their homes. So what Edison started was a revolution. Uh, he, of course, was then delivering uh, direct current, and uh, the, uh, the, the Tesla-Westinghouse uh, fight uh, in favor of AC current uh, evolved. Uh, they were three geniuses, but with uh, different uh, mindsets. Uh, that's why scientists are scientists, and they were geniuses. And eventually, uh, the uh, AC systems uh, prevail. The, the whole issue um, of the war of the electric currents started in the 1880s, and it was really George Westinghouse versus Thomas Edison in determining which version of power would form the basis uh, for the electric system. Edison stayed with DC because he started with DC and he was able to expand it. Westinghouse was coming in from another location. Tesla became dissatisfied with Edison because Edison really didn't want to look any further into his ideas for AC. But Edison's own concepts for power transfer were limited. You couldn't get power beyond the local neighborhood and you couldn't change the voltage to accommodate large and small equipment at the same time. On the other hand, Tesla was able to recognize that AC power could be transferred over long distances because the voltage could be raised and the losses from transmission could be significantly reduced. And the way that happens is that the current is, is, the, is the key factor. So with, you can transfer the same amount of power with low voltage and a lot of current or high voltage and very little current. 
The less current you have, the less losses you have. So the best way to transfer power is with Raise high the voltage. voltage. Reduce the current. Exactly. And the first transformers were invented at that time. So it was very easy to see how a transformer could do this for AC power, but a transformer would not work with DC power. In order to get the savings from transmission, you had to go over to AC. But there were problems with AC power as well, in that we didn't have a motor. Nobody had a motor that would work well off AC. You only had motors that could work off DC. And for lighting, you could go either way. Uh, but if you needed a motor and you wanted to have motors in your, in your customer base, you had to have that invented. So Edison invented the system for transmission, and he had invented the, the DC lights, DC motors, but he couldn't do very much with it, and he couldn't expand it very easily. It was very localized and couldn't scale <coughs> it to uh, fit the growing population. That's right. You'd have to build a Pearl Street, uh, let's say a couple of hundred Pearl Streets to cover all of Manhattan. It would have taken forever. Your dynamos are not yet good. Was that an error in your English? My English is more than satisfactory, as is my Italian, French, German, and Greek. Your dynamos have several inherent flaws that could be easily eradicated in a few simple measures of redesign. My dynamos right now are lighting up South Manhattan with a light brand new to this world. A brand new light. Do you know how many times that's happened before? Twice in theory, less in actuality. The first, Genesis 1.14, and God said, let there be light in the dome to separate the day from the night. And then the second, whether it came from the lightning in the bush being harnessed or the stone encircled pit over which hunched a creature with a piece of flint, they created fire, fire. Now is the third time. We have lit up the night again, and we lit up the night forever. For the third time in this world, there is a new light, and it is my light. I have created fire again, Mr. Tesla, and you, this is not yet good? No, it is not. I will give you $50,000, my Parisian, 50,000 U.S. American dollars if you so far change those dominoes that they will be indeed good. $50,000? That will be your bonus. The obvious start would be to consider alternating cards. Stop talking. I've observed numerous surprising qualities in you, Mr. Tesla. I have not anticipated recklessness to be among them. Recklessness? I have not ever exhibited any kind. You have. Recklessness is inherited in the form of the electricity known as the alternating current. It will not be used in my machines, ever. Regardless, I can improve your dynamos. Well, no, Mr. Tesla. Regardless, I don't believe you can. But that's the whole point, isn't it? competition. No sooner will you have something than somebody else will insist they had the first and now have it better. When I first manufactured the cardboard horseshoe bulb filament, William Sawyer insisted he had it first. Well, you can go goddamn keep it because I had a better burning bulb by a thousand hours in six months because the surge is always, always just a little bit behind. However, in Pittsburgh, there is a man, his considerable capital and limited renown come from what I believe is his single solitary and only invention, the air brake for locomotives. He is a businessman, mergers and buying and selling, and he is not content to be a step behind. Rather than following my footsteps, he wishes to take the market from me with a wholly different electrical system, a system that would run on my Parisians' foolishly idealized alternating current. He should have stuck to his air brakes. During the similar time, a young electrical engineer named Nikola Tesla, born in Serbia, was working on similar concepts, but with a different approach. In 1882, he moved to Paris to work as an engineer for the Continental Edison Company. Designing improvements to electric equipment brought overseas from Edison's ideas. According to his autobiography, in the same year he conceived the induction motor, 
and began developing various devices that use rotating magnetic fields for which he received patents in 1888. On June 6, 1884, Tesla first arrived in the United States, in New York City, with little besides a letter of recommendation from Charles Batchelor, a former employer. Why, Mr. Tesla, are you wearing yesterday's shirt? You are wearing yesterday's shirt. In fact, you are always wearing yesterday's shirt, and as you are always wearing yesterday's shirt, it is impossible to determine which day's shirt you are in truth wearing. I only hope that is as recent as yesterday's pie on it. Hmm. It's been a while since I've had apple. That's appalling. Yes, a dreadful waste of pie. When one does not consider one's appearance, it is of no wonder that... If you wish to continue to invent for the benefit of mankind, perhaps you should become less repulsed by their habits. And if you had not married a woman who made it the one object of her life to preserve you, you would have died years ago from sheer neglect. Then it would be your habits that would have erased those inventions so valuable. An American joke? A Serbian sincerity. It was a compliment. I heard no compliment. Yesterday's shirt. It is no compliment to point out the single time my appearance is comparable to yours. If you were swept up in a task, you couldn't be bothered by trivialities and a fresh shirt. I have finished. You ready me? Pardon? Finished what? The work on the dynamos. I designed 24 different types of standard machines with short cores and uniform patterns. They will replace the old ones. Well done. I think you should be quite pleased with the advances. Uh, they should be much more efficient and uh, durable. I think you should be pleased. So you've discovered all there is to discover then. I can uh, have everyone else take the rest of the afternoon off. Pardon? Well done, I said. Back to work. Uh, there is still the matter of... Yes? The bonus! The bonus that was promised! Who the devil promised you a bonus? What do you mean? In plain English, who the devil promised you a bonus? You did! I did! You did! I did not! You did! I want you to work constantly and never get paid. I'm going to offer you a bonus? I will give you $50,000, my Parisian, if you so far as make all of my dynamos... Uh, $50,000 if you... What? You still don't understand our American humor. Humor? After all it is, we come back with a simple American joke that eludes you. Joke? A joke, Mr. Tesla. An expression. $50,000 was nearly an initial capital of the Edison Illuminating Company in its entirety. And I would give $50,000 for dynamo improvements? If I had said a million, do this, Mr. Tesla, and I'll give you a million dollars. Would you come looking for the sum as well in cash, or should I just call my banker? A lie is American humor? You must learn to take a joke, Mr. Tesla, or your life shall be unsufferably long. To promise. Uh, promise. I designed 24 redesigned, different... Redesigned, really? No. I... They were redesigned in small improvements, nothing more. How could there be any great improvements? Precisely as I first said. No. How could there be any room for great improvements when you have invented yourself into a dead end, completely ignoring the advantages of the alternating system? Mr. Tesla. No. No. Your direct current simply sends in one direction, and this makes it weak. But the alternating current system sends it to the bulb, back to the generator, to the bulb, and back, like water flowing through a pipe, but it flows both ways, up and downstream at the same time. Which is not how water and pipe work. It's how electricity works. You want a water analogy? Then direct current is like a river flowing peacefully to the sea, while alternating current is like a torrent rushing violently over a precipice. How far can you send the power from Pearl Street? How far? A mile. A half mile? Yes, a half mile in each direction, a mile in diameter. That's what I just said. An AC station would send the power exponentially farther. Have, have you forgotten there is no AC motor? Light to a bulb is one thing, but the system of electricity is what cannot motorize. I have a motor. I have a motor. I have a... You cannot send alternating current out into this country. My direct current runs at a safe voltage constantly, continuously, and it shall continue to do so instead of alternating to a system that hangs wires of a thousand volts of uncontrollable energy over the heads of our citizens. Look at me, Mr. Tesla. 
I have not ever, nor will I ever, build a device to harm. Thank you for your work on the Dynamos. I have no doubt you'll find there's more to be done yet. I want a raise in my pay. Twenty-five dollars a week. You make eighteen dollars a week. Which is why I look forward to my raise to twenty-five dollars a week. All my technicians make eighteen dollars a week. I am not all of your technicians. Clearly. If I am to work for bonuses that are jokes and to waste my time on an inferior system, I want more money to do it. There is no future in the alternate system. It is a waste of time, and there is nothing I abhor my Parisian like a waste of time. You will have no raise. Then I quit. I know you do. I knew you quit. I quit. I knew you quit before the words escaped your lips or the idea formed in your head. I know you quit. I knew it first. Very well. I knew it first. I knew it all first. War of Currents was the first standards war. Alternating current prevailed for industrial and household purposes, but we never stopped using direct current in batteries and semiconductor devices. Today. In the 21st century, when we are on the verge of energy crisis, there is an urgent need to increase usage of alternating energy sources like solar and wind energy. It looks like this war of currents is a never-ending war.